right. Welcome to the Med School Index podcast. So grateful for Rebecca being here. I actually just purchased her lease in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and she was nice enough to come on the podcast and, and tell us about um, TCOM. So do you want to introduce yourself, Rebecca? Sure. My name is Rebecca, and I just graduated from TCOM class of 2022, and I'll be starting combined internal medicine and pediatrics residency at Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York. That's so exciting. Um, congratulations. And yeah, we just want to know a little bit about Fort Worth before we talk about the school. Like, what did you love doing there? And, and what did you like about Fort Worth as you lived there for four years? I loved Fort Worth. I'm really sad to leave it, actually. I was nervous to move to Fort Worth at first because I had never lived in a city that large. I grew up in a small town, College Station, College Town, and then I went to an even smaller town for undergrad, and so I was a little intimidated by what it would be like to live in a city, but I actually found Fort Worth to be so welcoming and comforting. And even though it is a big city, it feels like a small town because everyone is so nice and welcoming and it's extremely easy to navigate as well. It takes only 10 minutes to really get anywhere in Fort Worth. And so I became more easily accustomed to it than I thought I would. And I just thought the location of TCOM was so perfect. It was, it's in a great spot in Fort Worth. It's right in the cultural district. So it's next to a couple different museums, which are free for students or at a reduced cost to students. So that was fun to me. And it's also right near some really good restaurants and activities. And so I really had enjoyed my time in Fort Worth, did a bunch of different things. And what's great about Fort Worth too is that it has like different sections to it. So you have the culture district with the museums and you have the West 7th area, which is like more shopping and food and also where people like to go out if that's your thing to different clubs and stuff. And they also have downtown and Sundance Square, which also has amazing restaurants and shopping. And they also have the stockyards, which is true cowboy (laughs) Fort Worth. And (laughs) they are really continuing to build up the stockyards. I will say when I first got back to Fort Worth, the stockyards kind of seemed more like older adult vibes. Like it wasn't really for young people, like a lot of antique shops, which is fun and some good historical things and historical cowboy things. But my friends and I weren't really going down there to like eat or grab a drink or hang out or anything, but now they have just invested in that area. And there's so many fun things to do. They've put a ton more restaurants down there. Um, So it's really grown. And I was kind of like, man, why'd you wait until my last year here to make it (laughs) more fun? (laughs) That's such a great summary. I, I just visited Fort Worth for my kind of second look day at TCOM. And, um, I really loved exploring. I didn't get to see all those things, but I loved like being next to TCU as well. Like being next Mm -hmm. to like a major undergrad university, it's just like five minutes away. And, um, I don't know if you ever did those like shared bike things that they have in like most cities have them, but like, what's cool at, at TCOM is like, as a student, you get to use them for free. Yes. And so I just cruised around on those and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was free riding and I just got to see a lot of Fort Worth. So, yes, I love that. One of my fondest memories was, I think it was probably during just like a random day during first or second year, my friends and I hopped on a set of those city bikes and rode along the Trinity trails to one of our favorite places to eat lunch. And it was just like the perfect day. And that's one thing I'm really going to miss too, the Trinity trails that run throughout all of Fort Worth, such a wonderful place to go on a walk, go on a run, you can bike, rollerblade, if that's your thing. And it was just nice to like be by the water and all the different little parts of Trinity trails. Like the part by West seventh is different than the part by white settlement, which is different from the part, you know, behind my neighborhood. So it was always nice to get on those trails and like 
kind of try to connect with nature and get some vitamin D <laughs> after studying all day. <laughs> totally. And just to give some context to students, like the Trinity Trails is really close to the school, correct? Yeah, relatively close. And there are a ton of different access points too. Um, so there's probably one access point that's like a little bit more remote or residential, I guess I would say. And you can kind of go through one of the neighborhoods and get there. But the main section that's closest to the school is near the West 7th section. It's like right across the street from Chewy's. <laughs> so it's good if you eat at Chewy's and you can go on a post-digestion walk on the Trinity <laughs> Trails. And it's probably five minutes from campus. That's so awesome. And now that I think about it, I want to talk just a little bit about the campus because that's something that kind of sold me. Um, for example, I'll just say like the free gym there, uh, free nice. to students is I took a tour of it. It seems awesome. It's yes. open. I think it's open like seven days a week, right? Yeah, it is open seven days a week. I believe it opens at 6 a.m. in the morning and it closes at 11 Monday through Thursday. Thursday and then Friday I think it closes a little earlier and then Saturday and Sunday I think it opens at like eight or nine and closes mm -hmm. a little early as well but yes free that's the best thing and it is right I mean it's right on campus they have some designated parking spots but right next to the gym but you could if you have your parking pass for campus you can park anywhere on campus and just walk right over to the gym to have locker rooms um, that were recently remodeled as well. And the gym has like everything and anything that you could possibly need to get a good workout in like, I don't know, at least four squat racks, which is insane for a gym mm -hmm. that size, various machines. They have like a TRX. They also have group fitness classes, which are fun and also free. And they do offer like discounted personal training as well. I didn't do that, but I always saw the advertisement for it. And it's great that you mentioned free because my first year of medical school, it was not free. It was still cheaper than like, or more affordable than the other gyms in the area, but I did have to pay. And then my second semester, first year, they sent out an email and they were like, we're going to make the school gym free. And they refunded us, which was so nice. So yes, <laughs> I took advantage of the free school gym that yeah it's awesome I'm so excited and do you want to talk about were you a part of the new anatomy lab that they have there yes so my class was the first class to use the new anatomy lab and it is awesome it's really big it is well ventilated of course it's anatomy lab so you're still gonna have you know the formaldehyde smell but mm -hmm. there's tons of space um, you don't feel like you're encroaching on somebody else's tank. Um, and every tank has a computer monitor that's designated to it and a book stand. And so you and your tank mates can have your little reference area, um, right next to you, which is super nice. You don't have to like walk across the lab to, figure something out or reference your anatomy textbook, you can just have everything right there and it's all yours in your little space, which is nice. And then the whole back um, has more space. So when you do like an anatomy lab practical review or various um, opportunities like a suture clinic or procedure clinic or something like that, you have that space to um, be in there again without feeling like you're on top of one another, which is really nice. Super nice. And well, just while we're on the subject of anatomy, do you want to talk about, so at TCOM, as I understand it, there, you do full dissection, right? Yes. Full dissection, um, through, and you, your anatomy lab matches up with whatever organ system block you're going through. So they try to make sure that what you're learning about in class in lecture matches up as best as possible with what you're dissecting in lab. And that helps. I think it's helpful because it helps you understand better what you're learning in your lecture material because you can go into the lab and like see that for real. Like you can go find that vessel. You can go find and explore that organ system after you just learned about it that morning. And I think that kind of reinforcement 
helped me understand the material a little better. Yeah. I think that's a super nice way of, that it's set up. And also it's good for students to know that it is systems based curriculum, yes. right? Yes. Um, I don't know if this is true, but I was told at the interview day that the like, and I didn't really pay that close attention when I was there on the second look day, but like the windows are like, you can see through to the outside. So it doesn't feel like you're in a basement, but you can't see from the outside in for the like sake of the respect to the cadavers. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's exactly right. And it is so nice to have the windows because you do, I do feel like without them, yeah, it would be so sad, but the windows offer some like nice natural light and like a reminder that life exists outside of the anatomy. Lab. <laughs> yeah, that is super nice. And it's also open 24 seven if you want to just go in the dark. So yeah, exactly. And that was super nice. You just need your badge. And, you know, some people are night owls. Some people are early morning risers. Some people want to do stuff at random times of the day. Um, so it's nice that you can just go with what works for your schedule and um, study. Or if you wanted to even get your group together to maybe you didn't finish a dissection, um, go in and kind of keep working a little bit if you need or if you want to. And they also host um, anatomy reviews with um, the Center for Academic Performance Tutors, and they kind of send those schedules out. And so, you know, it's like Wednesday night at 7 p.m. until 9 p.m. We'll have CAP tutors in the anatomy lab, and they will be at stations and help you review um, anatomy material before the practical or help you better understand the anatomy, which is really nice. And it's free and you just kind of go and come and go when you please. That's super nice. Um, so I got a couple questions in regards to that. Um, just while we're on the subject of anatomy. So how many students do you dissect with approximately? So we do two blocks of two hours. So, and, and each tank, I guess, has eight people, but you're split up into two teams of four. Okay. So any, when you go in for your specified time, so maybe my specified time was 1 PM to 3 PM with my tank mates, it'd be me and three other people dissecting. And then from 3 PM to 5 PM, the other half of your tank would come in and dissect for those two hours. And you have a little handoff um, between, you know, the end of your two hours and the start of their two hours. So you'd have mm -hmm. kind of like a practice sign out and you'd have to talk about, okay, here's what we did today, or here's this interesting thing we found on our body or my, the anatomy professor, like Dr. Rosales told us this and, you know, be on the lookout for X, Y, Z, or here are all the things that y'all have to do today to finish up the body, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of nice, like nice because you worked as much as you could for those two hours, but you didn't feel like you, you had to get every single thing done because you had that teamwork to where you could say to your incoming um, tank mates, like, Hey, we tried to do this, but we were having trouble here. Like y'all try to, and it was nice to like have that kind of collaboration and camaraderie with your tank mates. I was always happy to see them at the end of the two hours because I <laughs> did not thrive in anonymous. So I was like, Oh, great. They're here. You know, <laughs> let me tell them what I did. And, you know, I tried really hard, but you know, it's time for a break. So <laughs> that's, that's, Super cool. I love the facilities there. Is there anything else you want to touch on with like um, just the facilities at TCOM or just, well, I guess we should say it is the University of North Texas Health Science Center. So there yes. is like a college of pharmacy, a, a variety of other, you know, health professions on campus. So it is a, a fairly large graduate campus um, exactly. with many buildings, but do you want to just talk a little bit about the the campus? Sure. Um, so when you are a medical student at TCOM, you'll spend a lot of your time at the MET, which is the Medical Education and Training Building. And it is one of the newer buildings on campus. 
I don't exactly remember when it was built, but that's where most of the lectures are held in the two auditoriums on the first floor. Um, on the first floor too, you also have the Met Cafe, which is called Four Star, and they serve breakfast and lunch daily, and they have little treats and coffee, and I was a frequent visitor, frequent patron of Four Star Cafe, and I will say their breakfast tacos are something that I'm going to miss a lot. I There's nothing like sitting in a lecture, getting to your break, going to the little cafe, and getting a breakfast taco and coffee for like two dollars. <laughs> oh, that's super cheap. Mm -hmm. So really affordable, easily accessible. Um, so that's kind of the first floor of Met. And you also have your Met locker room. And so every first and second year student um, has an assigned locker where you can keep your change of scrubs for anatomy or maybe keep your lunch or whatever you want to bring to campus that day, you can keep it in the lock or in the locker. And you don't need to have a lock, um, but certainly you can. And the locker room is only accessible with your ID badge. And so it really is only for um, people who have the badge. And so it's pretty secure. There's also microwaves and fridges in there. So you can keep your food cold and heat it up when you need to. So that's a nice amenity that's available to students. And then the various floors of the Met have different study rooms and different classrooms. The study rooms you can check out if you want or reserve, I guess I should say, through an online portal, mm -hmm. which is very easy to use. Um, you don't have to reserve them to use them. However, if it is reserved, you, you can't just walk in. And so it's just kind of the balance of like, do I want to just sit in a room and risk it or you know, hope that no one's there at 8 a.m. or do I want to reserve it and make sure that no one's there at 8 a.m. That's just kind of like up to you and how much of a risk taker you are when it comes to reserving rooms. But the rooms have, some of the rooms are like against the window and they have these big windows, which is really nice. Some of them are rooms without windows, but they all have whiteboards and tables and outlets. And then most of them also have tables for osteopathic manipulative medicine because TCOM is a DO school. So you have mm -hmm. OMM tables in there and you can practice OMM on your friends. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's what's mainly on the second floor. And then there are, there's third floor, fourth floor and fifth floor, I think. Um, one of the floors is really all offices for like ad admin people. Um, so that's where you'll find like the dean's office and various professors' offices or advisors' offices. Um, and one of the floors was mainly for physical therapy students. And so we didn't really go up there too much, but you are allowed to. And if you want to like mm -hmm. find a study space, you can, but we didn't really find much and it re wasn't really for us. So we didn't go up there too much. But then the fourth floor, I believe, is where the OMM lab is and the OMM lab is huge it's a big room filled with OMM tables um, and also on that floor are separate um, classrooms slash study rooms as well so they'll be used for your various clinical communication classes um, as well as your um, OSCEs and stuff like that. And when they're not used for those things, you can study in them. And the Met building itself is open until 10 p.m. Once it's 10 p.m., the police do come around and ask you to leave the Met. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Um, it's such a nice campus and it seems super new. And I imagine you spend most of your time in the Met building. Definitely the Met and then the Gibson D. Lewis Library. Uh -huh. um, and they <laughs> actually just remodeled the fourth or the, yeah, the fourth floor of the library. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about Gibson D. Lewis as well. Um, mm -hmm. Some people call it Gib Lib. Some people call it Club Gibson, various things <laughs> for the library. But um, the library is one of my favorite places spent so much time in there um, <laughs> and it has you walk in on the ground floor and there's a little cafe in the library as well and they sell snacks and coffee um, 
energy drinks, et cetera, to help you get through your study day. And there are tables and chairs in this little atrium where you can eat and not disturb people because it's right outside the main library doors. And then they have a section, and this is different from when I first started, but then now they have like a self checkout section and you can check out medical textbooks, um, medical, I guess, equipment um, for practice. Mm -hmm. Um, You can also check out like anatomy models, like bones and um, stuff like that. If you are more of like a tactile learner and they have a whole variety of books that you can use to help you study some practice question books, some textbooks, and um, it's all through a self checkout system online now, which I haven't used, but I imagine it's pretty easy, but also the librarians are very nice. The first Mm -hmm. floor of the library is a collaborative floor. So you're allowed to talk. Mainly it is um, tables that usually sit about four people and there are various tables on that floor. And that is collaborative study, although it's usually pretty quiet just because I don't know why, but it's actually usually pretty quiet. Um, There's some (laughs) big windows at the back, so you get some really good natural light. And then you walk up the big staircase and the next floor, which is technically the third floor, is also a collaborative floor. And that has more of like a modern feel to it. There are um, little booths, study booths. There's also individual modular like study chairs, more tables, tables with monitors that you can attach your computer to, or you can cast things to. So if you wanted to put up a PowerPoint on the big TV monitor so that everybody at your table could look at it, that's an option. There are also individual study rooms as well as group study rooms. Um, And the group study rooms will all have whiteboards, plenty of outlets, more seating. And then the fourth floor is the designated quiet floor. And there are a couple different parts to the fourth floor and they just remodeled it as well. So it's really nice and new and different from when I started, which is kind of crazy. Uh I did walk through it right before graduation. I was like, wow, it's not the same anymore. But (laughs) they have the main room, which has a few tables where that can sit multiple people. And then they have a lot of like individual study desks and they're pretty spacious, which is nice. You have... um, little screens that separate you from the neighboring desks as well. So it is pretty private and each little cubicle has its own whiteboard as well. And it's a pretty spacious whiteboard. It's not an eight by 11 size whiteboard. It is um, pretty big. And they also put in some more individual study offices, more study modular sections. And then they also have what I call the glass room, but it's kind of like an atrium, I guess. There's just a set of glass doors that kind of open up into that room. And those are where the bigger tables are that sit about four people. And so Mm -hmm. even if you're studying in silence, you can still study with friends, which is nice. That's super nice. It's, it's such a nice library. It's something I noticed while I was there too, is they had like um, some treadmills that you could like run on while also like it had like kind of a standing desk next, like, in front of it so that you could like study while you walk or, or if you can do that while you run, that's impressive. But, (laughs) um, they, and they had like standing desks. It's just super Mm -hmm. modern campus. It seems like in general. Um, so that's lovely. I, I want to like, um, I'm trying to think. So I feel like being that TCOM is like a systems-based approach. Um, let's talk a little bit about just like the general structure of like the schedule in the first two years. And in the sense of like, like when does TCOM start? When are there breaks? Um, like that kind of stuff, like the, the bare bones of the schedule. And then, um, and, and we'll go from there. Okay. So orientation for first year starts usually in like mid July. Um, and I believe it's about two weeks you'll probably know better than I do, but <laughs> I, my understanding is like a week, a week but I'm okay. sure the first week is kind of warm up as well. Like the first yeah. actual week. Yeah. So a week of like real orientation things and different sessions. And then I think you're right. Like a kind of a week to ease into it. And um, 
then you begin. Um, so orientation is pretty normal, pretty standard. I wouldn't really say there's anything special about the orientation um, parts in general, except for at some point during orientation, all of the clubs and organizations on campus will have different socials every night during orientation week and they'll, they will be at various places in Fort Worth. And so like Peds Club will have a social at Kung Fu Saloon or World of Beer. And sometimes different clubs and organizations will partner with each other. So it's like Peds and Anesthesia, which is kind of a weird combo, but you know, yeah, <laughs> maybe combinations that make more sense, but at various places throughout Fort Worth and like happy hour or, you know, grab and go dinner or game night or something like that. And that is so helpful to go to. And I would totally recommend all incoming students um, attend the socials and attend as many as you want, as many as possible. And I know it's hard because you just moved to a new place and you're meeting all these people and attending all these orientation setting, uh, orientation lectures, but it is such a good way to meet your fellow classmates and begin to feel involved in the TCOM community. Even if you don't want to join any of the clubs, um, you'll get to talk to upperclassmen, you'll get to meet your classmates and just start to build those relationships and build those connections, which is really, really helpful, especially when you're transitioning into something new. And there will be like an organization fair as well. And that's a more structured schedule scheduled event where every organization will have their own little table and they'll hand out free stuff and give you their information to join the club. And after that dies down is kind of when the academics really kick in and you start with a cellular and molecular biology class, um, which is everyone's least favorite class <laughs> usually because most people are like, what does this have to do with medicine? Um, I will say I was a cell and like bio, bio major in college. So I kind of liked it because I was like, oh, <laughs> I know all this stuff, you know, and I, I enjoy that stuff, but right. it doesn't last forever. It ends eventually. <laughs> That's the only class when you start actual academics, that is the only thing that you have kind of going on. And it is about a month long and, and they don't really introduce the other types of classes yet. So no anatomy lab has started yet. Um, no clinical communication class has really started yet. No physical exam class has started yet. And I think they do that because one, they know that cell and molecular bio is <laughs> the majority of people's least favorite thing. And I think they also do that just to help you ease in and not feel so overwhelmed, which right. I think is kind of nice. It's super nice. Mm -hmm. And then you do start your organ systems classes. And I can't remember the exact order that you go in, but then you start learning about the human body. <laughs> it's awesome. And first year is really all about how things should work, the physiology behind the different organ systems and understanding the normal way and the normal processes um, of the human body. And there's usually about two exams per organ system. And as we talked about, the anatomy lab will match up with the organ system. So once you start your organ system didactics, you'll also begin your mm -hmm. organ system related anatomy labs. So we are a TCOM lecture based learning but it is a combination of lecture and then more of a flipped learning classroom. And that means that they give you didactic information in a PowerPoint form that you review on your own, and then you will attend um, sessions um, that review the didactic material, but kind of in more of a question and answer way. Um, and so it during first year, it's really a combination of those two things. You do have some traditional lectures that kind of they are just talking at you, but then you start to have some of these flipped learning classroom style lectures, which test your knowledge and 
try to engage you a little bit more instead of you just sitting there, which is nice. And all of the lectures and the flipped learning styles, which they call MLMs, um, are recorded. Um, and they're recorded live. So they are posted a little bit later than the lecture time, but it's usually within the hour. I think it's like two hours max. And so you kind of have your choice of if you want to go in person to lecture or if you want to listen at home. And TCOM has, UNT HSC has its own like web based system. And I can't remember what the system is called, but you have access to it through Canvas. And, and you click on the recording, then you can watch the recording. Um, and it's not a recording of the professor's face. It's just a recording of the PowerPoint as they kind of click through it. With the audio. With the audio. Um, and you can watch that on 1.5 speed, two times speed. Uh, you can slow it down <laughs> if you really need to. So um, they try to make the learning accessible for different styles of learning, which is, which is nice. Um, there are some required lectures. Um, I can't exactly tell you why some are required and some aren't. Um, maybe a more <laughs> challenging topic is usually maybe something that's a bit more required. Uh -huh. um, and usually it's, it's, you know, worth it. And there, anything that's required, um, usually not longer than two hours, I'd say, but Mm -hmm. What is required are these types of lectures that are called um, team-based, like T, they call them TL, TLMs. I don't know what all the acronyms stand for, but <laughs> uh -huh. those are required. And these are specific to your first year where you are put into a little team with maybe like five other students and you attend the lecture in the morning on Thursday, and then you have a team quiz based on whatever material um, you had been reviewing and the lecture. And I believe it's like a five question quiz and it's a team collaborative quiz. So you all take it um, on, I believe you pick one person to like be the answer submitter person but you all work together to choose the answer. And then um, you'll also have an individual quiz. And those are usually the Thursday or the Friday before a Monday exam. And those okay. are always required. Um, but that's an opportunity to, again, work on your collaboration skills, um, work on talking through the material and it helps you identify any knowledge gaps that you may have before your exam. Okay. And these exams, I've heard that the first year they're like always on Mondays and then on yes. the second year they're Fridays. Yes. So first year they are mainly on Mondays in the morning because you'll have the anatomy practical in the afternoon. Okay. And then, um, and then they kind of let you do it on Fridays in the second year because you've acclimated, yes. <laughs> which yes. I prefer that they had them on Fridays the first year as well. But um, <laughs> that that is what it is. Um, and then and so are these exams pass fail or are they um, graded? And, and is there a class rank? Yeah, so the exams are graded. Um, however the grading system is kind of interesting at TCOM because oh, you, you get graded individually for the exams and the quizzes and all of that adds up to your final grade. And um, if they're still doing this, which I think they are, there's like a hard pass number and that number is actually a 78. So okay. if you make a 78 overall in the class after everything's been tallied up, then you have passed that class no worries, no problems, like 78 and above, you're good to go. At the end of every class, they run all the numbers from the students and the various scores in the class overall through some algorithm, and I don't know the algorithm, but then they developed um, a soft pass range. 
And that soft pass range means after everything has been calculated, they figure out the final passing number for the class. And usually that's around like 72, 73, 74. So that can be helpful. It can be a little stressful. Like if you're kind of like sitting at maybe like a 74 after everything's been tallied, you know, you took all your exams, you took all your quizzes and like your final grade is showing a 74 and you're like, okay, I didn't meet the hard pass because I didn't get a 78. You know, they've got to tabulate everything and then they announce the soft pass and then it's like a 72 and you're like, okay, I passed that class. And, and then it just shows up as a P on your transcript. And, you know, there's no like soft pass designation or hard pass designation on your transcript. It does just show up as a P, which is nice. Then they also do still use honors at TCOM. And I believe they set the honors score at 92 so I think if you get a 92 in the class you have honored that class and you get a little h by that class on your transcript okay cool and 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 there but there's no class rank it's just honors and pass so no class rank but they do have quartiles so they do split you up based on your numeric grades into first, second, third, and fourth quartile, Mm -hmm. but you will never know your exact rank and they don't, and, and your quartile can change, um, throughout your first and second year. So, okay. Okay. That's interesting. Super interesting. Um, trying to think if there's anything else, um, some things that I want to dive into, um, let's, let's do this first. So I think something that you know, a lot of DO schools, um, people here is like, maybe they don't have as strong of research. Um, but something that really impressed me about TCOM, um, which helped me decide on it, at least from what I've heard is there's really strong research there. Um, just because it's like a full health science center. Do you want to talk about like the research opportunities there? And, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I personally uh, didn't do really much research at all. Um, And it is an academic institution in the sense that they do have the graduate school for biomedical sciences and they have um, our public health school as well, um, which are great resources for students. I will say that Research is definitely available for the students who want to do it. I think you do have to work to seek it out a little bit, but people will be very welcomed to sit down with you and talk about it and navigate how to find it. You just have to put in the effort to find it, if that makes sense. Um, and they do present some opportunities to you, but you know mm-hmm. if you're looking to do something specific, you'll probably have to set up a meeting with whoever it is that you want to and, you know, be direct and ask them about the opportunities that are available in that specific thing. As far as research opportunities during first year, during the school year, um, I feel like they're not presented to you right away. And so if you're like interested in jumping on it right away, then you might have to do a little bit of that reaching out on your own. But at the end of first year, Um, they start to do some presentations about the various research opportunities that you can start over the summer. And so there are a couple of different options that TCOM presents to you. One of them is the pediatric research program, and that's a partnership with um, Cook Children's um, in the pediatric department. And they have a variety of topics And it is a little bit of the application and interview process, but they have a lot of spots. Um, And so that is one way that students can start being involved in research. And they have been helpful and yielded good opportunities for students, I think. And for some students, you know, they've gotten publications out of that, um, or they've written research articles or, um, 
they definitely made posters and there is a specific like research presentation opportunity through the pediatric research program. It's, you know, that at the end of the um, summer, everybody who did PRP like has their own um, kind of PRP little conference. And so uh -huh. everybody who does do it does make a poster and has the opportunity to present it, which is a really great opportunity. And they also have another research opportunity over the summer called MSTAR, which is actually a geriatric research opportunity. And I do believe that MSTAR is paid. So that's a nice little perk. And when <laughs> I say nice. paid, I, I guess I mean stipend. Yeah. Um, but that's <laughs> nice. And um, let's see, you can also, um, you know, find your own opportunities, like I said earlier, and people are welcome to do that as well. Then I believe it's at the end of first year. If you are in the top 10% or perhaps top 15, I can't exactly remember the cutoff. I think top 10%, then you get invited to join a research class. And I don't believe it's required. It is an invitation that you don't have to accept, uh -huh. but if you do choose to accept, that's an additional class. I'm not sure how often it meets. I was not in the top 10%, so I did not join this research class. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, you meet a couple of times um, throughout the semester and have specific classes about research that help you understand what is research and um, different um types of research and things like that. And then you also do a research project through that class. And I believe it can be on anything you want. Um, you just have to, you know, find the right mentors and make sure it's approved and it makes sense and stuff like that. So that's also another opportunity. And then, um, of course, in your clinical years, um, the onus is a little bit more on the student if they find an interesting case and like want to write up a case report totally do that. You just need to make sure that you have a resident or an attending who you're working with. And I would say that as far as our connections with our clinical rotation sites and our mentors and attendings and residents there, usually they're very enthusiastic about helping students getting that to helping students to set that up, which is really nice. I never did any of that myself, but I have lots of friends who mm -hmm. found interesting cases and decided to make a case report out of it. So there definitely are research opportunities. I say you have to be a little bit proactive about them. They're not going to be just like handed to you. But right. at the end of first year, there are designated presentations about upcoming research opportunities. So that is nice. That's super cool. Um, yeah, no, it sounds like there's opportunities in like the labs with the PhDs. And then definitely. And then also they have like these set up clinical research programs. So that's really interesting. Um, well, jumping into like the clinical years. So I know I have like my limited understanding. So there's like the main rotation sites that it seems like most students do their rotations at, which are in Fort Worth at JPS and Cook Children's. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple other hospitals, but it seems like those are the main ones. Mm -hmm. And then there's also like rural opportunities in Longview and then now you can go to San Antonio and there's also a few opportunities in Corpus Christi. Can you kind of talk about where you went and then yeah. maybe where some of your, your classmates went? Yes. So when, so at the end of your second year, they send out a survey about where you want to do your clinical rotations and the majority of people do stay in Fort Worth, but we do send some people to different sites for the whole third year. And those sites are Longview, Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas, and Conroe, Texas. And I am not sure about the San Antonio site. That is new to me. I haven't, uh, I, I, that wasn't available to me as a student. Um, but okay. this idea of we send a couple students to these various sites, um, and you preference where you want to go. And so you know, people who have a lot of family in Houston, they may preference to go to Conroe so that they can mm -hmm. spend their whole third year kind of closer to home, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, same if 
people ha do have family down in the Corpus Christi area or in East Texas, you know, people might preference those places because that's where their family is, which is really nice. And TCOM tries to be understanding of that, um, especially when like family's involved. And likewise, they're also, they also try to be understanding of people who want to stay in Fort Worth for family reasons, or, you know, just want to stay in Fort Worth because that's where they want to stay. And Fort Worth is the location that has the most clinical sites available. But I think we send 12 people to Corpus Christi, six people to Conroe, eight people to Longview or six people to Longview. So there are some students who go to these places every year and spend the whole year there. And then um, we also do have the Rome program, which we can talk a little bit more about separately, but the students who are in the Rome program, they do their rotations at rural sites all across Texas and their Rome coordinator helps them identify which sites accept Rome students and helps them um, set up those rotations um, as well. So that's a little bit of a separate thing, but for kind of the general student, um, the and as someone who did them in Fort Worth, um, you do have the opportunity to rotate um, throughout the medical district at Fort Worth, which is really cool. Um, we have a good working relationship with John Peter Smith, which is the county hospital, and we send students there for family medicine, internal medicine, surgery, psychiatry, and OBGYN rotations. Am I missing anything? I think that's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and then um, we also have relationships with the various Methodist hospitals in Fort Worth as well. So there's mm -hmm. um, Harris Methodist, which we send people for usually for emergency medicine, although you can do your emergency medicine rotation anywhere. Um, and I believe we also send people to Harris. Um, for their OBGYN rotation. We also send students to Cook Children's for their pediatrics rotation. Um, and then we have various clinical sites and opportunities for family medicine, which is exciting. You get to um, experience different clinics for family medicine. Um, Oh gosh, what am I trying to say here? Like my family medicine rotation was all the way out in Watauga at a small family medicine clinic with only two um, physicians there. But I ended up spending both of my four week blocks of family medicine at that site. And I really liked it. I ended up being the only student there. Um, but other students may be at some larger family medicine sites where they do get to see, you know, four other students who are with other preceptors. Um, and let's see, what else about rotations am I missing? Oh gosh, I've hit a wall, I think. No, that's awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, if you think of anything, let us know, but I guess, and, and with that, um, you know, as you transitioned into like applying to residency, um, did you feel like there was any bias towards like you being a DO or, um, TCOM as an institution, or do you feel like it was very well received? How did that process go? I did not feel like I really received any discrimination or bias being a DO applicant. Um, that may have something to do with the specialty that I chose. MedPeds is very welcoming and they are really passionate about a holistic review process. Mm -hmm. And I definitely appreciated that and felt that on all of my interviews. Um, and who's to say if there are algorithms in place that screen out DOs, I just had to let that go and let that go out of my mind and remind myself that the places I got interviews are interviewing me because they want to, and they don't 
care that I'm a DO or if they do care, you know, it's in a positive way and they're looking for students who have that DO behind their name. Um, But I, it was important for me to not act like there was kind of a bias because if I did, even if there maybe was, if I did that held me back from being the best candidate that I wanted to be. Um, but as far as my actual interview days went, I never received any like weird remarks about being a CEO <laughs> or like anybody questioning my credibility as an applicant. Um, I will say I did take both sets of boards. So I did take USMLE and Comlex, and that's a big heated debate that still exists in the medical community. And we don't need to get into all of that, but I did <laughs> take both and in the end, I'm glad I took both. Am I frustrated by it? Yes. But is it something that I would change? No, I don't think, but it kind of just is what it is. But (laughs) I will say when I was looking at residencies, there are a couple different databases for residency research and you can look at how many DOs they've taken in the past um, Mm -hmm. and kind of the percentage of DOs at their institution. And I did do that. And I made sure that the programs I applied to had at least some history of DO students. And then if I did find a program that didn't have a history of DO students, I just kind of thought to myself, like, how much do I really want to apply to this program? Like, do I like what they offer as a program enough to, you know, risk that of being the first DO, you know, in their, in their program. And so that's kind of just a personal decision. I feel like you make, um, I definitely don't think you should let being a DO hold you back from doing anything that you want to do, because if you put yourself out there, you know, the worst that someone can say is no, but you did the best that you could, you put yourself out there, you did everything in your power to, you know, make whatever you wanted to happen, happen. And I think that is the most, the more important thing is that you tried. And if, you know, someone doesn't want you because you're a DO, then that is their loss um, and kind of your gain because you don't want to be in a place. All right. We had a quick uh, internet disconnection here, but, um, you know, picking up where we left off, Rebecca, go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, I think, just talking about embracing being a DO student and not letting it hold you back. I think it is an asset, especially with your training in osteopathic manipulative medicine. That's a whole nother skill set that you can use. And even if you decide not to use OMM as a practicing physician, you still have that experience of learning this technique and learning something new. And I think that's very valuable and that can translate into your future career because as a physician, you will always be learning new things. And so having that doesn't have to be you know, a waste of brain space or a waste of energy. I think as long as you channel it into something positive, then um it will be beneficial to you. And the way that TCOM, I think, emphasizes how they teach their material and the types of preceptors that they work with and want to be professors for students at the didactic and clinical level, they are interested in this idea of the whole body is connected and interrelated and it's important for us to understand that your body and all the various things in the world and things that happen to us and around us all affect one another. And I think that is really the foundation of health. And I think as a society, we're beginning to see that a little bit more that everything is interrelated. And I think TCOM does a good job of having that be the foundation of their curriculum and the way that we learn things, which is great. So don't let being a DO hold you back because it's great and awesome. Totally. I agree. And I think that like 
I, something I want to just say is like when I was, you know, talking to people about going to TCOM, I talked to people from like a variety of different fields and, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what field you go into, but if you are interested in something like dermatology or neurosurgery, like, you know, there are people who have done that in very recent years and in, sure. in long time ago as well from TCOM, um, several dermatologists in the Salt Lake city area where I'm at are graduates of TCOM. Um, so, <laughs> and some yeah. are young and some are older. So I think it's, uh, something that people can, can know that they can go in with confidence, but, um, Rebecca, do you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about, we skipped some of the curriculum, um, about the OMM and, and the, those labs? Yes. So as a DO student, you will have to learn OMM and that usually looks like during first and second year, you'll have lab about once per week, sometimes twice per week, but usually just once per week for about two hours. Um, so it is kind of the same structure as anatomy in the sense, like you go in for two hours and then you leave and another cohort of students comes in and does their lab time for two hours. And so that is what a day might look like for you every Wednesday, you'll have anatomy lab from one to 3 PM, and then you'll go straight to OMM lab from three to five. So it can make for kind of a long day, but, um, you spend that time in the OMM lab learning about the foundations of OMM to start. And then your OMM labs do also follow the systems based schedule. So when oh, you are, cool. yeah, which is again, really nice, really helpful for that reinforcement um, of the curriculum and the material that you're learning. So when you're in GI in lecture, you're learning about OMM that relates to the GI system. So that's helpful. Um, and you'll have separate OMM um, exams in, in the sense that they're called DOCS. And I can't remember what all the acronyms stand for anymore, but you'll have you know, a DOC at the end of every kind of OMM system as well. And you'll be asked to perform a, you'll be asked to perform a technique on your lab partner and your um, professor will grade you on the technique. And of course they will evaluate how well you did. And, you know, if you didn't improve the dysfunction, you may have to repeat the doc, but it's nothing um, super stressful. It can feel nervous because you're, you know, doing a technique and you want to do your best. And sometimes it doesn't work, but <laughs> then you just redoc and they're really kind about it. And it doesn't have to be a super stressful environment. They want you to do well. And so the redoc really just consists of um, some extra teaching time. And then you try again, and it's usually the next day or next couple of days or so. Um, but you do have little evaluations about OMEN, so that's important to note. And then you'll also, you will have, um, during your second year, you'll have OMEN questions um, on your exams as well. And so that's kind of like a separate exam score, even though they'll add up for a total score, there is mm -hmm. a separate um, amount of questions specifically about OMEN, and you do have to past that part specifically as well. So it is important to pay attention and learn. Usually the questions aren't too bad, but it is something that you need to review and study for. Okay. So super cool. So like the first year, it's just kind of like you go to lab and then that same day you have like a kind of like in-person, like more or less quiz on like how to do the manipulation. So the quiz isn't until the end of the organ system block. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Yeah. You have and, practice times in the labs and then eventually an evaluation. Okay. That makes sense. And then the second year, it's like the same thing, but in addition to that, um, didactic lecture exams will have OMM questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. It's usually like 10, nothing crazy. Okay. Awesome. And then, um, oh, you were about to talk about the, um, the class where you do like the doctoring skills? Yes, yes. So during first year, you'll start 
to learn your doctoring skills. And they start off by um, helping you understand um, how to interview patients. And so they call it clinical communication. And again, it's usually about a two hour block. Um, and this is how TCOM does a lot of the scheduling, very similar to, you know, maybe anatomy for the two hours and then OMEM for the two hours in one afternoon. They'll usually do that with ClinCom. So they'll do, you know, Thursday from one to three, you know, your cohort or your group of students does it from one to three. And then another group of students will do it from three to five, but they are small groups. Um, and so it's usually you and three other students with one professor and you start learning how to interview patients. And so you go through the different techniques and then eventually, I can't remember the timing, but every couple of weeks you'll have practice interviews with standardized patients. Um, and it's just the interview part during first year. So just asking, you know, what brings you in today? Can you tell me a little bit more about that, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, those are, you do those in front of your classmates in your little small room. And um, at the end, you'll be able to work through feedback from both your peers and your professor, which is really helpful to have someone watch you. It can be a little nervous to like do it in front of other people, but it is helpful to have that live feedback of, hey, this was really good. Or I really liked how you asked that question. You know, did you see how that elicited this information from the standardized patient? And then also have the feedback of, you know, I see why you did it this way. This way would be really helpful, you know, try or try it in a different way. Or I see that you stumbled on this part about, you know, what they eat in their <laughs> diet or something like that. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, I could, here's something that works for me that, you know, would be helpful to you. So it's nice to have that feedback. And then during first year as well, you also have a physical exam class. And I believe that's once a week. Um, and that's where you start learning your various physical exam skills. So you'll learn how to do a musculoskeletal exam. You'll learn how to do an abdominal exam. You'll learn how to do a neurological exam. And there are, again, every couple of weeks, a little evaluation where you do it on your lab partner, your physical exam partner, a fellow student and a professor um, will evaluate you and offer feedback as well. Those things then prepare you for second year where you have what's called clinical integration, which then combines your practice interviewing and your physical exam. And so you begin to kind of complete a more full patient visit. And that's what you prepare for. And those we do in the, we have standardized patient rooms. And so they look like actual clinical exam rooms that you would find in an office. And you are able to go through a whole clinical encounter um, with the patient and they're recorded. There are cameras and you are recorded so that you can watch yourself back. Um, and you'll watch yourself back. You can watch it. You do watch it on your own and you kind of evaluate how you did. And then you do watch it again with your small group. And so, so you get that feedback from your peers and your professor as well, because sometimes your peers and your professor see things that you don't see. And when you're doing it in the moment, you know, like, just as I said, you know, like that's such a filler word and it's not even conscious, but then you watch yourself back in the video and you're like, oh my gosh, I said, you know, 5 million times, <laughs> I can't yeah. do that. Or, or I forgot <laughs> to ask them this question or, you know, and so, oh my gosh, I said again, see now I'm conscious about it, but <laughs> it is a helpful way to see your progress and learn how to interview patients before you start your clinical rotation so that when you do start your clinical rotations, you're not like a deer in the headlights yeah. asking, how do I do this? Because you've had at least some practice experience and the standardized patients are awesome. They're really good at what they do. TCOM has a really good relationship with their various standardized patients. And it's actually a really sweet part of TCOM going through your first and second year and seeing the same 
to your nice patients and they get to see you hopefully improve as well. So it's really amazing what they do. And I think it's a really great opportunity for students. And I love that we do that. Super cool. And in relation to that, I know when I went there, they had like a bunch of technology where you could like practice innovation and things like that. Like, did you ever get the opportunity to try that or do like the ultrasound? Yeah. So TCOM has really started to improve their ultrasound curriculum. And it's something that has become part of the curriculum. And it's only grown since I've been in didactics. So I'm not exactly sure what it looks like now for students, but I do know there are required um, ultrasound modules and learning sessions for students. And we did use a program called Sonosim. I'm not sure if they still use the same program, Um, but there are online modules that you review before the training session. And then you go for your training session with your peers and a professor and you get to ultrasound on your friends. (laughs) So you do get that real life experience, like on a person, it's not just on a mannequin, which is so cool. And And did you get to practice the innovation as well? Yeah. So during second year, I believe is when we start having the scheduled simulation labs. And again, everything matches up. Everything that we've talked about matches up with the organ system. Um, So your patient interviews, you know, when you're on MSK, you're doing MSK related patient interviews. Okay. You're doing MSK related ultrasound. You're doing MSK related OMM. Um, and same with simulation lab, like you're doing MSK related simulation. So maybe that's cast learning how to cast or et cetera. Um, so the sim lab used to be in the Met, but as I understand it, they have just remodeled the basement floor of the library, I believe. And I'm not sure if it's finished yet, but they are making a brand new simulation center at UNTHSC, which is super exciting. Um, The simulation center in the Met was already really nice. It was spacious and it had a full, um, it had a full classroom learning with um, the like live action mannequins and Mm -hmm. the monitors that you could input different vitals and run different scenarios. And we also had a full operating room set up as well. So the simulation lab in the Met was already great, but they have put in the investment to make it even better and even bigger. So that's something that's really exciting for incoming students to hopefully look forward to. I'm not sure when it opens, but um, yeah, I think it opens this July and I don't know. Awesome. I saw something about like a $50 million, like NIH yeah. grant for like virtual reality. And I, I don't Ooh. know, I'm excited to see what the virtual reality yeah. is as well. So that that's cool. so interesting. M- my last uh, two questions first is just, could you just provide a little clarity on like how they break up the colleges? Cause I know that, um, TCOM does have a large class size, um, similar to some other schools. Like I know Ohio state has a large class size of 230 students, Mm -hmm. but they're broken up into like four different colleges. Can you explain that, how that works? Yeah. I don't know how they assign you to the specific colleges, but they do assign you to different colleges and there are, let's see, I was in Elko, um, and I don't know how many students are in each college, um, but they call them advisory colleges. And through that, that's how you um, get paired with your advisor that helps you through the medical school process. And they're, you know, people that you can go to for advice, um, for feedback, for help. And then the colleges also host social events within the college as well. So it's a great way to meet friends, build that camaraderie. And there are six at TCOM. Um, And they are honestly just a way to help you stay organized, but also a way to connect with others. But I think they are always trying to make them more fun and have more events. And it was hard during covid because you couldn't have those in-person events, but they're really starting to bring them back and like invest in, you know, 
Elko College karaoke night, or I've seen some colleges, they'll do like painting with a twist and they'll have um, painting with a twist, you know, come to the Met and the event is in the Met Cafe from five to seven and there's dinner and then you get to do your little painting with your college. So it's a fun way to build camaraderie and also um, get paired with someone who can help you navigate through medical school. That's super nice. So is there just like one mentor per college or? No, there's a couple. Okay. Um, so my advisor maybe had 10 students, but then there were also like three other advisors in Elko college. Okay. Super cool. Yeah. Well, um, there, there's been so much in this, this episode. It's been amazing. Anything that you would just say lastly that you loved about um, TCOM before we drop off here? Yeah, I know it's going to be cliche, but I just, I really did love the people. Um, the people are what made my medical experience so net positive. Of course, there were difficult times and it was one of the most challenging things I've done in my life as far as academics goes and adjustment goes, but I just have such fond, fond memories of medical school already. And when I say people, I mean the friends that I've made, but also the professors that I met and the staff that I worked with and the preceptors I worked with and the opportunities that were available to me that people helped me identify and helped me navigate and helped me achieve. And I just feel so grateful for all the support I received as a medical student through all the different ways as well, academically, professionally, mentally. It was incredible. And I couldn't have done it without the people who supported me on campus. And I also will say the location is amazing. Fort Worth is such a great city. It's so fun. It's safe. There are things to do for everybody. I mean, you you can find anything that you want to do in Fort Worth. If you want to be more of a nature person, like you have that, you may have to drive a little bit, but like you can make that happen. If you want to go on a little hike, it's not that far from Oklahoma either, which has some great places to be outdoors. If you are interested in the local art scene, you can explore that. If you want to be a a cowboy or cowgirl at heart, you can do that (laughs) too. Um, There's just a lot of great things happening in Fort Worth and people are happy to live in Fort Worth. People are happy to be there. It's just a really fun, exciting, growing city and I think those two things are what helped make my experience at TCOM so, so positive. That's such a great review. You're, you've honestly gotten me really excited to go. So thanks so much. <laughs> and uh, thanks again for everything. Good luck in Albany. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if anyone has any questions, they can contact me too. Um, you can text whenever and I'm happy to help. Sounds great. Maybe we'll throw that contact information in the show notes. (laughs) All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks.